Good morning, church. Come on, let's give Jesus some praise in here. I can use both hands. This is weird. Oh, it feels good to be back in the house of God today. And uh, so blessed that you're here with us, church family. And uh, we're excited about all the great things God is doing in our church. We first want to say welcome. If you're a new guest, maybe you're even a second time visitor, we want to say a wel special welcome to New Anthem Church. We hope it feels like home to you, feels like family to you. And uh, we want you to know about our mission, our vision, our values. Go ahead and go to the About page on our website. It's a great way to connect and really discover um, what our church is all about, what the heck we're doing here in Macomb County, because we're a church that's on mission. And I don't know about you, but I, I say this all the time. I went to church for years without knowing the mission of the church, without knowing the vision, without even understanding or being taught in church why I was at church. And so um, I think it's so important that to be a church on mission, and uh, so we have a very specific vision that we filter everything we do here through, and we want you to know more about that. And so uh, we're just excited for what God is doing. I know uh, Jason uh, mentioned it already. We're so excited about this West event next week. Uh, it's really our big first step as we recruit, and uh, we're going to have information that we're going to be handing out as you leave, uh, handing out to you about that event, uh, and that is really for you to put in the hands of someone else, give a personal invite, or maybe even bring them. You'll get a free uh, meal out of it, so if you want to bring them, if you have a friend over on that side of town that maybe would want to be part of something. But when you, I want you to know this as well. A, a new launch team for a church, it doesn't necessarily require church people. In fact, we had, we had unsaved people on our team. We had people that even thought they were saved and weren't on our team as we were launching the church, uh, and that many of them are now a part of our church, and they're an integral part of our church. And so um, it, it really doesn't matter um, who they are, what their background is, uh, if they are even into church. If they just want to be a part of something bigger than themselves, I want to encourage you not to only invite, but to maybe even bring them along next week for our first Discover Night. I want, I want to turn your attention to the Word of God today, and we're focusing and emphasizing prayer. And we're focusing and emphasizing prayer because in my life, specifically, God has been emphasizing prayer. In, in fact, a little over a year ago, um, God simply told me this, you're not praying enough. I almost said, Pastor John, you're not praying enough. God, I don't think God calls me pastor. That'd be weird. Uh, he just said, you're not praying enough, right? It's like, okay, I need to be praying more. But I, I realized there was a trickle-down effect in that really we as a church, we weren't praying enough either. And I felt God press that on my heart. And so we invested. We, in, in fact, if we have an app, if you, you can go to the app store, you can download it. And uh, you may be wondering why we have an app if we just wanted to use it to promote and market. That actually wasn't our core motivation. In fact, if you talk to any of our board members, they'll tell you the only reason we even talked about getting an app is because there was a way to, uh, we had a prayer feature on there where you could submit prayers, have people pray for you, and we wanted to increase the prayer culture in our church. And so we've released that, and we see dozens of prayers submitted every single week, and we average over 20 20 people every single week that prays for every specific request, and it's incredible um, what God has done with that. But we also started a weekly prayer gathering for the members of this church, uh, for people that are part of our A team, part of our membership here, uh, and we, we get together on Saturday mornings and we pray. We lift up the name of Jesus. And so God, over this last year, has been continuing to press this prayer and worship and prayer and worship, and we want to be a, a church that's founded and forged in prayer and worship. Amen? This is what God is calling us to be. And so if you feel that today, if you feel that pressing, maybe God's pressing that on your heart. In fact, maybe as soon as I said, um, hey, uh, we're supposed to be praying more, you felt like, man, I've been feeling that same thing. Like God has been pressing me to, to get on my knees, to, to get before him in prayer before the king of heaven. But I, I want to make sure we're hearing that directive and feeling that directive from God the right way. See, because some of us, if you're like me, you can hear certain things from God and then Satan likes to twist it and distort it, right? So, so I, I can hear from God that, that he wants me to pray more, but, but how Satan twists it is I suddenly believe that, that I'm just, I'm, I'm not a good enough Christian. I'm not doing enough for God. I'm not, they're, they're, I could be doing more and God needs me and God needs me. And, and just with a little twist to what God is pressing on our heart, things can get distorted and you can become very discouraged in your faith. And I wonder if anyone else shares that same struggle. And I believe what God is inviting us into for those of us that maybe grew up in families and, and, and maybe your parents were the parents that like, they would ground you just for like looking at you weird. 
Like, I just don't like your face. You're grounded. Like, that was my, that's the family I grew up in. I was that kid. Like, pretty good kid, didn't really get in trouble, but would just kind of get grounded for no reason. That was me growing up. And some of us, we project those issues and that perspective we have of our earthly parents on the God of the universe in such a way that maybe even affects our prayer life, what we go to God with. And, and so I want to I wanna challenge this if I can. And, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer. In the book of Matthew, some people went to Jesus and they said, hey, how are we supposed to pray? And, and Jesus laid it out plainly. He laid it out so clearly. And so we're going to be looking at what is going to be familiar to some of us. And my encouragement for those of us that would find this to be familiar is that you wouldn't cause your soul to check out in any way. In fact, would you lean in? Because I believe God has something specific he wants to say to you. Jesus responds with this. He gives us the, the outline, the structure for prayer. In this manner, therefore, pray, Jesus says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word today. Would you pray with me, church family? Father, we take a moment to center our hearts around you. We remember you. We remember you in such a way that would recognize you in this place. You're present here with us today. You want us to leave here changed and transformed. And so, God, the reality for every single one of our hearts today is that we want and desire to lean towards you, not away from you. So even in the hard things, even in our insecurities, even in our brokenness, God, would you help us to lean in towards you as we discover truly how to communicate with you best. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. So Jesus lays it out for us. He gives us a structure for prayer. And what we're going to do for the rest of our time today is we're going to expound on a really a, a message talk that I started in our pursuit nights, which were our weekly uh, midweek gatherings earlier this fall. I want to expand on this idea uh, and, and kind of take this prayer apart. Uh, so hopefully we'll be left with a greater desire, a greater understanding uh, and means for, in which to pray. He starts out with these two words, our Father, our Father. Now, we actually need to pause right there, and some of you are thinking, like, Pastor John, can you read a little bit more scripture before you start taking it apart first? I get it, but it's just who I am. Our Father, these two words are significant, and culturally, these two words have significant impact. Why? Because these two words would have been considered too intimate. These two words would have been considered too personable when talking about the king of heaven. See, with the Jews of the day, to talk about God was to talk about a God that was massive and expansive and was an authority and was in charge. God was God Almighty. And God our Father was not a phrase culturally up until this time that was pop popularly used. Now we have this word, our this would have been abnormal because the people of the day, Jesus, God, our Father, wasn't something that was personal. He wasn't ours. He didn't belong to us. He didn't do life amongst us. He was a being who was withdrawn, who was big, and who was in heaven. And so we step into the presence of God, but then we pray as a member of a family as we do life with the God of the universe. So we have our, and then we have the other word, this other word, father. Again, a word Jews would not have used during this time. It would have been considered far too intimate. One theologian says this, it rightly recognizes whom we pray to, coming with a privilege of title that demonstrates a privileged relationship. So there is more attached to this in this brand new phrase as Jesus is using this, as he's teaching us how to pray. And then he says this, in heaven. 
And what Jesus is doing is he's painting a picture for us. He's trying to give us a directive. He's trying to paint a picture and show us our position. Like, like God is here. He's father. He's daddy. He cares. He's a good, good father who cares about the good gifts, giving good gifts to his kids and giving rich life to his kids. He is a good God and he's yours, but he's also in heaven. And the reason he's going to be able to get all of this good things and this blessings done in your life is because he's in heaven. We operate in the tangible. God operates in the intangible. We operate in the, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the real. We operate in the now. We operate in the physical. God operates in the supernatural. We are on earth below. God is in heaven above. This is the reality of our position before God. This is how God is going to get this done in our life. He's God. He's Father. He's big because he's in heaven. And then Jesus immediately points us to three elements about this big God, about this personal God, three elements about God. And ultimately, he's trying to help us discover what Jesus is really about, what God is really about. But not only what God is fully about, but simultaneously, he's also communicating some things that ultimately we're going to struggle to surrender to the God of heaven. He says this, Hallowed be your name. As we're praying, God's giving us this playbook. Jesus is saying this playbook. Hey, for after we recognize, okay, God, he's our father. He's big. He cares. He's here. We need to understand it's about his name. God is and will always be, first and foremost, about his name, about his glory, about his renown. In fact, one uh, pastor, he says it this way. He says one of the biggest cr uh, struggles he sees amongst Christians is that a lot of people inside the church were so quick and excited to lift up the name of God. But many of us make the mistake of doing so, believing and in hopes that while we're lifting up the name of God, that he will lift up ours. See, there is this wrestle and struggle. We have this fight for whose name comes first. Because the world will ultimately teach us that it's about our name. It's about our desires. It's about our renown. It's about how we're going to be remembered. We are taught to even guard our name and guard our reputation first and foremost. And what Jesus is pointing us to in this first element that he, not only is he about his name, but that we will find joy when we are first and foremost about his name and not our name. So he says, hallowed be your name. And then he says this, your kingdom come. Jesus is about his name. Jesus is about his kingdom. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the activity of God here on earth. I used to think about the kingdom of God. I used to think of like the animal kingdom, right? I used to think of like a big like clouds and this angelic places, a bunch of, uh, you know, small babies with wings, with man faces playing harps. I used to think of this as the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the activity of God, the works and the righteousness of God. And watch this. It's here on earth. Well, how do angels work on our behalf? Why can't we see angels? Because they're operating in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is here and now, and it's a realm beyond what we can see with our eyes. And it's at work, and the works of God is at work in the kingdom of God on your behalf for your good and for his glory. And so he says, hey, you need to be about my kingdom. But so many of us are about our kingdom. We're about our name, but we're also about our kingdom and what we're building. Because we're self-made men and women. Jesus didn't build this. I built this business. Like, you didn't have to go to college for eight years. I went to, I got my master's degree. I put the work in. And with a little twist here, with a little misunderstanding of how life actually works and how the blessings of God actually work, what we're left is with a kingdom that we built all on our own. And not only do we believe that we built this kingdom apart from anything that God could do for us, but that kingdom comes first. And we guard it and we protect it. 
And we get offended when we read things in the word of God about God's kingdom coming first, seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto us. Well, that's a good sentiment, but we just have to check and make sure our kingdom is good, and then we'll be right there, Jesus. We'll be right over there to worry about your kingdom. Your kingdom come. Jesus is first and foremost about his kingdom. Jesus is helping us as he's giving this structure of prayer of how to posture our hearts. When we go to God in prayer, are we coming with our list or are we starting with, oh, that's right, you're, you're on the throne, you're in control, your name is great, and your kingdom is what all this is about. And then lastly, he says this, your will be done. Your will be done. This can be prayed two different ways. Hey, God, um, your, your will be done. You're going you're gonna to do it anyways. Whatever you want to do is fine. I'm cool with it. It's whatever, your will be done. Or, God, your will be done. Whatever you want to do, my heart is open. My soul is open. I just want to receive from you. Hey, wherever you lead me, I'm going to follow. I'm going to move in the direction. Wherever you want to go is where I'm going to step. Because for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God, your will be done. It sounds the same, but it's not really the same. Like, it's no different than, like, conversations we can have with our, in our earthly relationships, right? Like, me and my wife have this conversation. She's like, hey, where do you want to go to eat? Like, I don't care. We can go anywhere, we can go anywhere you want to eat. This was our conversation last night. Or we've had another conversation that went like this. Hey, where do you want to eat? Hey, babe, you can, we can go anywhere you want to eat. You hear the difference? And we can go to God one of two ways. We can go to God with angst, reluctantly. God, do whatever you're going to do. Or we can go to God in hope, with clinging to him as our hope, clinging to him as our truth, as our answer, as the solution, saying, God, do whatever you want to do. I'm going to move. I'm going to step when you say, and I'm going to be patient, and I'm going to be wait. I'm going to wait on you. And I'm going to move when and where you tell me to move. In church family, we need to know this. When it comes to our kingdom, when it comes to our name, when it comes to our will, we, we can't go to the world for answers with any of these subjects, right? Because the, wor- the world will have an opposing and contrasting view on every single one of these subjects. The world will say, it says this, it says, your name's great. Though the gospel declares in Philippians, at Jesus' name, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. The world will say, hey, build your kingdom. The gospel says, beg for the kingdom, pray that the kingdom would come to earth. The world says, hey, do your will. Whatever you do, whatever you feel like, that's your truth, and it's all good. Jesus says this in John 4, my food, my sustenance is to do the will of the one who sent me. And so we see this contrasting, opposing idea between the way the world works and the way God set things up to work. So we have these three elements. Jesus continues on. It's going to be about his name, his kingdom, and his will on earth as it is in heaven. So this isn't something that Jesus is setting up for like us someday in eternity. No, no, no. God's heartbeat, the heartbeat of Jesus, is that he would set all of these things up to work here and now. Well, we want to see God's will. We want to see God's glory. We want to see God's name lifted high. But it's easy to forget that God's doing this kingdom work, that God's activity in the earth, that he's up to something good here on earth. It's so easy to forget that. Why? Because we turn on the news. And we see what's going on in our world. And we hear all this news, all this craziness with Russia. And it's easy to just look for a second and believe and just even skip in your mind and just go to a place where you'd say, God at some point left the building. But the book of Matthew says that God's activity, this kingdom work, God's kingdom is not just advancing. God's kingdom is forcefully advancing. Like, I get this idea of, like, like people marching into battle. Well, well, what is God's kingdom, and how is it going to advance? You ready for the answer? It comes to us a couple chapters later in Matthew 16, where it says, The gates of hell will not be able to prevail against 
the kingdom work that he's going to do through the church of Jesus Christ. This is why, church, we're not building followers here. We're not just building followers that just try to come and see the great show on a Sunday morning. We are building an army. And we're building an army of believers that would march into battle. When he says, he's talking to Peter, and he says, the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against the church. And some of us would think, that means, no matter how hard Satan tries, he's not going to be able to take us out. I've read it that way for years. That's not what the verse says. That, that, that would paint this picture that, that what we're supposed to do in this, like, this church is like a bunker. And we're just hiding out while the battle's going on. Gates of hell not prevailing would assume that we as the church are on the offense pillaging the gates of hell to the glory of God. And this is how he's going to get it done. Through his kingdom work, his activity here on earth. Not just in heavenly places, not just battles with angels and demons, but the amazing kingdom work that he's going to do through the church. And so the lives that have been changed and transformed in this church, that's the kingdom of God at work. The marriages that have been redeemed and restored, that's the kingdom of God at work. The people that have been brought back from the brink of the edge, when they were at the edge of the rope, we've heard so many stories like that of people that are a part of our church. That is the kingdom of God at work. That's not chance. That's not happenstance. That's not people showing up and feeling the good, good vibes and hearing a couple of songs and hearing a pep talk and going home. That's the kingdom of God at work through the church. And the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. He goes on, and Jesus, he says this. He shifts gears, and he says, give us this day our daily bread. Have you ever wondered, like, man, Maybe you've read that before. Have you ever been like, man, what does bread mean? What does he mean by bread there? He means bread, like actual bread, like sliced, like loaf of bread. What is, it, what is Jesus talking about? Jesus is pointing us to reality, that it's okay to pray for our daily needs. There, there, there's daily needs that we have that are reality. For some of us, it's bread. Some of you are like, I'm gluten-free. I don't eat bread. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for healing. Um, <laughs> But, but God cares about your daily needs. He, he knows what you need. He knows everything that you need. And he says it's okay to pray for it. See, some of, us, some of us feel guilty praying for those things. Some of us feel guilty praying for like even certain things like healing. Like we, we have a sore back, but because the world's just gone crazy and there's all this craziness going on even in our, even in, um, the, you know, our own backyard and, and there's poverty and homeless people and all of this stuff, we like don't want to bother God with it. God cares about those things. God cares about your needs. God cares about your desires. God cares about the seemingly stupid things, even the little things in your life. God cares about all of it. I've said this before, y'all. I pray for my golf games because I want to get better. Come on. <laughs> and that man prayed for my golf game a few months ago, and I got my first ego when he prayed for my golf game. <laughs> Like, we can chuckle and we can laugh, but this is the kingdom of God at work. He says, hey, pray. Hey, test me. Hey, talk to me. And when you do that, your life will change. It'll, it'll get better. It'll improve. You'll get deeper. You'll find healing. You'll find restoration. Hey, pray about all these things. Why? Because he cares about your needs. He cares about your daily needs. But not necessarily your daily greeds. You know what I mean? Like, I talked to a pastor one time. He's like, man, God's doing so much in my life, but I think I'm just going to, like, walk away from ministry because I think God's calling me to be famous. <laughs> like, he'd been praying about it. Like, I've just been praying. I've been telling God I just want to be famous. Like, and it'd be, like, it'd be one thing if it's like, I just want to help people and reach people for Jesus. He doesn't want to. Like, it's the weirdest thing. Like, I'm not saying, like, God, like, isn't going to, like, answer that or even give that to him necessarily. That God isn't going to answer a prayer. I'm just saying, it's a weird prayer. Like, it's a bold prayer. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily find myself praying that prayer. God cares about your daily needs, not necessarily your daily greeds. He continues on. Jesus says this. He says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So some of you are like, I don't understand that reference because you're used to the forgiveness our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But that's so many S's, and I always end up spe speaking with a speech impediment. I sound like an idiot. So I just, I learned debts and debtors. It works for me. C.S. Lewis says this, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. And then to mention the subject at all 
is to be greeted with howls of anger. So friend, what is your pattern for forgiveness look like? What does your pattern for forgiveness look like? Do you struggle to forgive? See, some of you got like nervous when I said that. Like, well, Pastor, you don't really, you don't know my whole situation. You don't know the story. You don't know the person that I've been dealing with. They're crazy and they don't deserve my forgiveness. Did you deserve God's forgiveness? I, I didn't deserve God's forgiveness. I definitely did not deserve God's And I've been forgiven much that I can forgive much. We've all been forgiven much. Sins, past, present, and future. Fully, freely, and forever forgiven. This is what Jesus does. So how are we forgiven? How are we forgiving other people? Some of us, forgiving other people really isn't our issue. Some of us, that's really easy for us. Some of you, your biggest issue is the person you struggle most to forgive is yourself. All of your failures, your, your mistakes, your brokenness, your, the mistakes you made in your past, the, the time you were rebellious from God. And although God's not throwing that in your face, you continue to throw it in your face. And you're still not experiencing the freedom and the liberty God created you to walk in simply because of what you're not forgiving yourself for. You have that long list of things that you hate yourself for. Yeah, we need to forgive others, but you need to forgive you as well. Here's what's interesting. The next part of the text, Jesus transitions, and he starts talking about the spiritual battle. He says, hey, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This should be our prayer. In fact, when Paul writes to the church of Corinth, he says this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. And so here is a question this morning, church. Will God give you more than what you can handle? Yes, he will. He absolutely will. And people read this text, and they get it wrong. And people have paraphrased this text, and they get it wrong. God will not allow us. God doesn't tempt us, but he won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. But in our life, we're going to experience things that are more than what we can handle. I experience something that's beyond what I can handle every single month, sometimes every day. And this is what keeps me driving my knees to the foot of the cross, keeping my eyes fixed on Jesus, because I can't do it on my own. And it's the moments that we think that we can where everything falls apart. We see this pattern going all the way back to the people of Israel wandering around in the wilderness. As soon as, as, as we think, we're good now. That's when everything falls apart. But Jesus is drawing our attention to a spiritual battle. Isn't it interesting that as, as soon as he talks, starts talking about forgiveness, forgiving others, forgiving, our, uh, for, forgiving ourselves, and, and living in peace with everyone, he immediately starts to talk about the spiritual battle. Why? Because that's the enemy. Satan's the enemy. Not the person next to you, not the person you're married to, not the person you do life with, not your coworker, not the person you can't stand on social media. Hey, Satan's the enemy. And the enemy has one goal, according, according to John 10.10, 10, to steal, kill, and destroy all that which God is trying to bless you with. And that verse goes on to say, but I come, this is Jesus, I come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. This is who Jesus is. He's reminding us there is a spiritual battle. There's a real battle. That's the enemy. We need to pray about it. We need to be consistent praying against it, praying against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places, as it says in Ephesians 6. In fact, when we pray weekly as a, a membership team here, uh, one of the things we pray consistently is, is against the enemy. There's always a point in service where we all get fired up. It's usually me. And we always get fired up, and we all start praying against the devil and what he's doing, and how he's causing complacency in people and complacency in their church and causing the men of God not to be men of God and not to step up. And I was causing families to split up and break apart. And we pray against that in Jesus' name. Why? Because we're keeping our attention on who the actual enemy is. 
Oh, you thought the enemy was political? The enemy, friends, is spiritual. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. We have a real enemy. It says, and deliver us from the evil one. Jesus wants us to have a perspective of who our enemy is. And he finishes and he wraps up saying this, for yours is the kingdom and the power and glory forever and ever. Amen. We started this prayer. Jesus starts this prayer by drawing our attention to the kingdom. And then Jesus finishes up this prayer, drawing our attention back to the kingdom. It's like he's saying, and remember, there's only one way he's going to get this done. There's only one way we're going to get this done. In fact, this is how it, we would do so well to start handling our prayers this way. As we go to close, and instead of just like, in Jesus' name, amen. I think that's what we're supposed to say. Like, guys, you're big enough to make this happen. Yours is the kingdom. It's your kingdom. It's about you. It's about your name. It's about your kingdom. It's about your power forever and ever and ever. Amen. And as Jesus is wrapping up this prayer outline for us, he's drawing our attention to the reality that the only way this is all going to get done in our life, in the reality of our life, is if God does it. Because God's big enough to handle it, amen? Now, I want to talk for a moment briefly about where some of us are in a danger and really where I believe God is, is maybe leading us as a church. See, many of us, at one point in time, at one point in our journey, we had a fire for Jesus. Something lit a spark. Maybe it was our moment of salvation. Maybe it was an event. Or maybe it was just coming to a place in a, in a space in our life where we understood the gospel different than another time. And, and so we... we, we had a fire, we had a passion, like, like God did something, and, and, he, and he lit a spark, and, and, and our fire was just burning red hot for Jesus. It was easy to pray. It was easy to go to church. It was easy to serve. It was easy to do all of these things. And then, like, something happened. Maybe we're no longer at that event. Maybe we take a few weeks off church. Maybe we take a few months off church. Maybe we, we, we start to isolate ourselves. We so easily and quickly forget that spark and that fire that we once had, that hunger, that passion, that desire we once had for the things of God. How it was easy to pray, it was easy to do all of these things. We forget. And then what happens? Life happens. Life begins to pour on life thing, right? So we have that, that, that bill that comes out of nowhere. We have that behavior that we used to wrestle with and struggle with all the time. We haven't really dealt with it in a while. And all of a sudden, we're just dealing with it and struggling with it all the time again. Don't know what that's about. We have that addiction that we thought we conquered, rear its ugly head. We have a new addiction form that we've never had before, a new coping mechanism, because we haven't dealt with an issue from our past. We have turmoil, tragedy in our heart, death of a loved one. We don't know how to navigate. We thought that the counseling, we thought it took, but maybe we, maybe we need to go back. these things get poured on and poured on. And let me tell you what happens. Maybe we reach a point. We come to our senses. We, we look at how, how we're barely keeping our head above water. We come to a place where we're like, I just want to go back to that place where I was hearing God's voice, where I had that spark, where God was doing stuff. And so maybe we come back to the house of God. We come back and we're and we're just we're excited and we're because we're gonna get our spark back, we're gonna get our fire back and our flame back, but we it's just prayer doesn't feel the same anymore. And I'm worshiping that that doesn't that doesn't feel the same anymore. 
and I'm in a small group, and that that doesn't seem. Maybe I just maybe I need to find a new church because I just I don't feel like I'm I'm getting my my spark back. I don't have that fire that I used to have. So maybe we start looking for something else to fan the flame to give us that passion to light that thing that that God wanted us to light all along. For us today, friends, we need to know that a prayer does something. What a consistent prayer life does is it draws us near to the source of the flame. We're struggling, we're struggling as we pray. The Bible says if you draw near to God, if you will draw near to you, and we pray and we draw near to God, and we will draw near to you. Prayer brings us to the source of it all. Friends, this is how we get our spark back. This is how we get our fire back. This is how we get our flame back. And some of us are struggling thinking that was only a moment. That was only a season of life. That was only when you were younger, when you used to go to camps and retreats. No, God wants you to carry this all the time. God wants you to, to shine with it brightly all the time, consistently. It's the heartbeat of God, it's the intention of God, and it is found in your prayer walk with God. Can we bow our heads this morning, church, as we close? I wonder if you're here this morning, and you would say, your prayer to God would be, God, I just want that fire again. I want that passion again. God, I want you to fan the flame inside of me like like it used to, or maybe like never before. If that's you today, you would say, I want that fire. I want that fire. I'm going to ask in a count of three, you just lift your hand in the air. One, God loves you so much. Two, the Bible says today is the day of resurrection. Three, if that's you all over this room, I want the fire. I want that fire. Anyone else? Awesome. I want that fire. I want it to burn within me. God, like that spark. I need to get my spark back. I need to go back to the source. God, I thank you for every single hand that was raised. People that love you, that want that fire, that want to feel your presence when they pray. They don't want to just go through the motions. They don't want to pray because of some kind of duty or checklist to try to just pray and read your Bible every day. They want real, authentic relationship with you, fire with you, a flame with you. God, would you fan it in their life? God, I pray for every single person that's desiring more of you, God, the depths of you. Would they discover all of that and more? Well, as our heads are still bowed and our eyes are still closed, I know there are some here today for you, your sole struggle is that you've never actually formed a relationship with Jesus. I want to give you that opportunity. We give people that opportunity every single week here at New Anthem. The Bible makes it real simple. In 1 John it says, if we just confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so you can have a brand new start with him today by confessing, I'm a sinner, I don't got it, and saying yes to Jesus a new relationship with him and start not doing life on your own anymore but moving in the direction of Jesus. If that's you, you would say, yeah, Pastor John, that's me. I want to be included in that prayer and I want to start a relationship with Jesus. I'm going to ask you again on the count of three, you would lift your hand in the air. One, God loves you so much. Two, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Three, if that's you all over this room, I want to walk with Jesus. Anyone else? Awesome. Anyone else? I want to say yes to Jesus. I want to say yes to Jesus. Church family, well, let's let's pray this prayer, and we're going to say this prayer out loud, every single one of us, and we're going to do so as one church family supporting all those praying this prayer for the first time. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I repent of my sin. Turn away from my sin. Help me to live for you the best that I can. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Come on, can we celebrate with all those that made first time decisions this morning? Hey, that's, the, that's the greatest decision that you could ever make, and we say this every week. It's not a prayer alone that saves you. What a prayer does is it starts a relationship with the King of the Universe. And so um, we're so
so glad that you made that decision. We have something called Growth Track. It happens in between our 9 and 11 a.m. service every single week. So it'll be happening next week. It's a great on-ramp for your faith to discover more about your ch- uh, the church, about doctrine, the doctrine of the Christian faith, uh, and, and then just your uh, position before God in this church. This church exists as a broken bunch of people, uh, myself included, that are just trying to learn more about a perfect Savior. And so uh, none of us are perfect. None of us are trying to be. But we do believe in a perfect Savior that's trying to make us more like Him every single day. And so that's just why the vehicle of the church exists. We want to help you on your spiritual journey. I want to encourage you, if you uh, maybe prayed that prayer and you, you're just looking for a friend, you love Jesus, but you're just looking uh, to, to just deepen your walk with Him. There's so many options from small groups. Um, and uh, it, it, we have growth track, we have worship nights, there's so many uh, things that you can be a part of to deepen your faith. Uh, and then all, as always, if you'd like to stay and pray at the altar, you're welcome to do that. And I want you to know as a church, we pray for every single one of you every week. We pray for this service. We pray for every single person before they walk through the doors. And our prayer is always the same, that the Lord will bless you and keep you, cause His face to shine upon you, for His countenance to be gracious to you. Life is the best. Yes, you